You're listening to Brains On, where we're serious about being curious. There are several secrets or real keys to making a paper airplane fly well. And really, they're not secrets because I'm going to tell you. My name is Ken Blackburn, and my job is working for the United States Air Force as an aeronautical engineer doing research on the next generation of air vehicles. But my passion is paper airplanes. I've been fortunate enough to set the Guinness record for time in the air for paper airplanes four times. The very first key to having a good paper airplane flight is starting with a good design. Some of the classics that we know, like the Dart, are classic because they actually work. If you've ever been on a plane, you know the drill. Put the tray table up. Make sure your seat isn't reclined. Fasten your seatbelt. And get ready for takeoff. The plane taxis down the runway, speeding up, and then... You feel the wheels leave the ground. The plane continues to climb into the sky. The cars and people and houses and trees get smaller and smaller. The captain comes on and lets you know that you've reached your cruising altitude. This routine happens thousands of times every day. So although it's commonplace now, the idea of being able to fly a plane around the world, let alone across town, seemed like a fantasy not so long ago. We're going to find out how planes work and how they were invented. And we've got some more great paper airplane tips, too. Keep listening. You're listening to Brains On from NPR News and Southern California Public Radio. I'm Molly Bloom. Joining us from Columbus, Ohio, are 14-year-old Zora and 12-year-old Nairobi Whitfield. Hello. Hi. Thank you for being here. Zora and Nairobi are here to help us answer a question that we've gotten from lots and lots of listeners. How does a wing on an airplane work? How do airplane jets work? How do airplanes stay in the sky? That was Jason and Simon from Bolton Landing, New York, Amina from Beirut, Lebanon, and Tommy and Lizzie from Muscat, Oman, asking those very popular questions. Humans have been trying to fly for a very long time. It's hard to know exactly how long since we don't have any written records for all of human existence. But the first historical account happened around the year 1000. Al-Jawahi strapped two pieces of wood to his arms like wings and jumped off a tall building. Needless to say, this didn't work. He died trying to soar like the birds. But that didn't stop others from trying pretty much the same thing. Several people in Europe tried strapping wings to their arms. And sometimes their feet, too. At least one was able to glide a short distance. But most attempts ended in injury. Gloria Goldfinch, our friendly neighborhood bird, is here to explain what she has that we don't. I've never spoken into a microphone before. Uh, Testing, testing. Is this on? You can hear me. Oh, good. Okay. You may have noticed that we birds are designed just a bit differently than you humans. For one, our bones are hollow, which makes us much lighter. And when you add in our incredibly strong breast muscles and the design of our wings, we generate enough power to stay in flight. And I know you've been eyeing my gorgeous feathers. And you're right, they do look good. But they serve a purpose. They help propel me through the air and steer, balance, and land. So any wings you strap to your arms are just a sad, pale imitation of what we have naturally. Thanks for taking pity on us, Gloria, and sharing your insight. Absolutely any time. I love the sound of my own voice. So it takes a lot to fly. But why exactly is it so difficult? That's because the ability to fly is a delicate balance of four forces. Thrust, drag, lift, and weight. Thrust is the force pushing forward, and drag is the force pushing back. Weight is the force pushing the object down, and lift is the force pulling it up. Throughout history, there were successful attempts at getting off the ground. And staying off the ground. Before the invention of airplanes. There were hot air balloons. Which harnessed rising hot air to rise up and stay aloft. And gliders. Which glide on air but have no engine or source of power. Early gliders were difficult to control and couldn't go very far. So what were the keys to finally getting a contraption off the ground that could be piloted and powered and controlled? Meet the Wright brothers, Orville and Wilbur. Ladies and gentlemen, the day was a long time in the making, but on December 17th, 1903, the Wright brothers have done it. Their flying machine has flown. Hooray! The Wright brothers designed self-propelled aircraft, left the ground and flew four separate times on that day, the longest of which lasted 59 seconds. 
Brother Orville was at the controls. That's me. The Wright brothers have always been tinkerers, first with printing presses, then bicycles. They caught the aviation bug a few years ago and have been designing, testing, redesigning, and retesting ever since. We've had some setbacks along the way. Some of our early gliders were, to put it bluntly, real duds. But we never got discouraged. Back to the drawing board. The wings alone were quite the undertaking. We tested about 200 different wing designs in our wind tunnel. Very impressive. Leap ahead to 1904, and the Wrights have done it again. After more tweaks in design, they've flown in a complete circle this time. One minute and 36 seconds. Huzzah! And then we come to 1905, their third powered aeroplane. 24 and a half miles in 39 minutes. Only for us! To the patent office! Not an overnight success or a flash in the pan. Orville and Wilbur Wright showing that working and reworking is what it takes for an idea to get off the ground. Zora and Nairobi, you know a little bit about what it takes to be an inventor. You've taken part in something called the Invention Convention. So Zora, can you tell us what that is? What is the Invention Convention? Well, the Invention Convention is a program where kids are encouraged to invent based off of everyday problems that they observe and make an invention to solve those problems. What was your favorite invention you've done so far, Nairobi? Um, My favorite invention was Healthy Roots. What was that? Well, it was a plastic pot liner that had tubes that wrapped around it, and the plastic pot liner would go inside of, like, a pot where you kept your plants, and the tubes had holes inside of it so so that when you poured water into the tube, the water would go through the tubes and come out of the holes, making sure that the entire plant got enough water. And what what problem were you solving with that one? Well, usually people think that either putting too much or too little water inside of the plant would like help it grow, but actually the entire plant needs to get a lot um, the right amount of water, like even water amounts. So how many versions of that invention did you have to do before you landed on one that you were like, okay, that works now? Um, I had to do three. Um, the first one, when I poked the holes inside of the tubes, the holes were um, too small. And so Hardly any water got out. And then the second one, I did, thought I didn't need the plastic pot liner, so I just put tubes around the pot. But I made the holes larger so that more water could get through. And the third one, I would used the pot liner and made the holes larger. And so when you finally found that that worked, were you? how did you feel? I felt really happy because I finally got the right prototype. Nice. And Zora, what, what is your favorite invention you've made? It was an invention called Pastry Perfection. And it was an aluminum pouch with a cotton grip handle that prevented you from burning your fingers on the side of the toaster. So tell me what that looks like. It's kind of like metal, except it's more of like foil. And it has a grip handle at the top. And it's kind of like in a square shape so that you can put your pastry into a little pocket and then put it in the toaster. And then can you take it out with your bare hands? You can take it up by the grip handle. And the aluminum, it does not conduct as much heat since it's thin aluminum, and so you don't burn your fingers. It cools down really quickly. And what kind of, like, like Pop-Tarts? Is that what goes in there, or what? Yeah. Nice. It, sounds... it was based off of Pop-Tarts. <laughs> <laughs> sounds delicious. And so which invention that you've worked on was the most frustrating, would you um, say? An invention called Leave-Em. What is that one? I wanted to have an easier way to compost, so I made a biodegradable bag, which is a bag that breaks down with leaves and compost. It was supposed to go over a tree so that when the leaves fell, it could go inside of it. Except that idea didn't work because there's really tall trees. <laughs> so it's hard <laughs> to have a bag big enough. Yeah, I had to put it around the base of the tree. And then, so, so it sounds like you brainstorm, design the model, make the model, and then test the model. And then what happens after the testing? Um, you do it again to try to make it better. As has there ever been a time where you've tested your first prototype and it's been perfect? No. So there's always some problems to work out? Yes, that would be great, but no. <laughs> what advice do you have for kids who might want to try inventing something? I would just say to use your imagination. And it does, it's not that hard to look for problems in your everyday life. You just have to open up your eyes and ask people. That's excellent advice. How about you, Zora? 
I would have to say that whenever you're having trouble with something and you're like, oh, I wish there was something better, don't wait for someone else to come up with a way to make it better. You just write that down and just think about ways to fix it. Before we get back to learning how planes fly, we have another challenge for you. It's time for the mystery sound. Here it is. Any guesses? It kind of sounds like nature at night with all the buzzing from the bugs. Ooh, good guess, Zora. Nairobi, do you have a guess? Um, a factory, maybe. Excellent. So we have nature and factory. I like that. So we're going to be back with the answer in just a bit. The second tip I have for a really good flying paper airplane, make your folds really crisp and to make all the folds very even. And one of the most common problems is that the creases were not made sharply and the wing becomes thick and that adds drag. So symmetric, meaning that the wings are even on each side, sharp folds. Any questions you want to hear answered on Brains On? A mystery sound you want to share? Or maybe you want to send us a drawing? Email us. We're at brainson at m as in Minnesota, pr dot org. Or you can send us mail. You can find our address at our website, brainson.org. And while you're there, you can sign up for our newsletter and listen to all of our past episodes. If your summer travels, take you outdoors we love to see your photos just post them on social media and tag us we're brains underscore on or you can use the hashtag brains on parks the brains honor roll gets longer and longer every day these are the kids who keep us going with their ideas mystery sounds and high fives here's the most recent group to be added to the brains honor roll Genesee from Boston, Elizabeth from Cincinnati, Jillian and Georgia from Fort Smith, Arkansas, Maya and Noah from Squamish, British Columbia, Oscar from Brooklyn, New York, Liam from Omaha, Henry from Maple Grove, Minnesota, Eliana from Mountain View, California, Atlas and Aldis from Houston, Lila from Atlanta, Zoe from Houston, Elliot from Traverse City, Michigan, Dylan from Belfont, Pennsylvania, Miranda from Tarzana, California, Tegan and Henry from Arlington, Washington, Joaquin and Camille from Pleasant Hill, California, Oliver from Greenwood, Virginia, I Alanda from Calgary, Alyssa and Maddie from Warwick, Australia, Silas from Westbrook, Maine, Sebastian and Mateo from Denver, Tristan from Cape Town, South Africa, Miles and Dylan from San Carlos, California, Balpreet and Orpaj from Germantown, Maryland, Claire and Caleb from Townsend, Montana, Martha, Sarah and Ruby from Singapore, Eloise from Belmont, Massachusetts, Alec from Ross's Point, New York, Ava from Culver City, California, Claire and Iris from Scottsdale, Arizona, Katie from Toronto, Chandra from Brooklyn, New York, Rachel from Durham, North Carolina, Carolina, Jung from Acton, Massachusetts, Kira from North Wales, Sylvie from Coos Bay, Oregon, Samuel and Nathan from LA, Nasia and Michael from Vancouver, Willem from Atlanta, Noah and Eva from LA, Hank and Vivian from Portland, Oregon, Oliver from Corona, California, Leaf from Nelson, British Columbia, Signe from Portland, Oregon, Milo from Evanston, Illinois, and Coda from Napa, California. My third tip for a really good flying paper airplane, and this is the one that most people don't know about, are the flap settings. If you were a pilot in a real airplane and you wanted to keep your airplane from nose diving, you would pull back on the control wheel or back on the stick on the airplane. And what that does is that the control surface, the flap on the very back of the airplane is deflects up. Every airplane behaves like a seesaw. So if you deflect the air off of the end, it's like pushing down on the back of the seesaw, and that makes the other end go up. The airplane is the same way. When you bend the back edge of your wing up just a little bit, all right, grab it between your fingertips and twist it at a slight angle, that deflects the air up off the tail of your airplane, and by pushing down on the tail, it lifts the nose and keeps it from nose diving. And that's probably the single most important thing you can do to make your airplane fly really well. You're listening to Brains On from NPR News and Southern California Public Radio. I'm Zora Whitfield. And I'm Nairobi Whitfield. And I'm Molly Bloom. 
It's time to tackle that question. How do planes fly? To start, you have to think of air as stuff. Even though it's invisible, air is made of gas molecules, and these have mass. It weighs about two pounds per cubic meter. Levitation engineer Casey Hanmer thinks it's fun to picture that stuff being moved around by us and everything else that moves through the world. And, and as you kind of walk around, you don't really think about the air kind of parting in, in front of you and going behind you. But it's, it may be a thing to, like, imagine all the air moving around at all times, like, you know, blowing in the window and going up the side of the mountain and, and being shoved out of the way by falling rain or flying over the wings or over the body of, a, of an airplane or around all the cars and whatever. It will give you an appreciation for... Just, just how much the poor gas that surrounds our planet is, is kind of shoved around by everyone and everything. What does an airplane have in common with shooting a basketball, wiggling your fingers, or even blinking? They all move air molecules. Air is key to those four principles of flight we talked about earlier. Thrust, drag, weight, and lift. Ella Atkins, aerospace engineer from the University of Michigan, says we all know what drag feels like. You know, whether they're in a soapbox racer going downhill or on a bike that's just going really fast in the wind. Basically, that feeling that the air is pushing on you to push you back so that you can't go as fast as what you might be able to go if the air wasn't pushing on you. The faster you go, the stronger the drag is. So airplanes, which are traveling very, very fast, experience a lot of drag. Air is pushing against the plane. In order to overcome drag, you need thrust pushing in the opposite direction. That thrust comes from a plane's propellers. Or its jet engines. The wings of a plane, meanwhile, are what provide lift. Remember, that's the force that pulls up. Now, there are a couple of concepts you need to understand in order to wrap your mind around lift. The first is from Sir Isaac Newton. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. This comes into play with the propeller and jets. Well, a propeller is like a little wing that's tilted. So as it spins, it pushes the air back at a high speed, which in turn, this is an equal and opposite reaction, pulls the plane forward. And the faster you spin it, the more air is pushed back. So then the more that the plane is pulled forward, that's called thrust. So a, a jet engine is very similar in that it's trying to push air out the back of the nozzle of the jet at as high a speed as possible, and it wants to do a large volume of air because if you have a large velocity or speed of air and a lot of it, it has a, an effect of pushing you forward a lot. Again, an equal and opposite reaction overall. And this comes into play with wings as well. The propeller and the wing, they both work the same way. They, they take a bunch of mass, in this case air, and they shove it down or backwards. And as a result, there's a, an opposing force produced against the wing or the propeller that, that moved the air out of the way. The second concept key to understanding lift is from Daniel Bernoulli. The Bernoulli principle says that when the speed of a fluid increases, the pressure it exerts decreases. Air also acts like a fluid. When you narrow the path of air or water, it speeds up. So the shape of the wing narrows its path on the top, speeding it up and creating less pressure there. If you look from the side view at a wing, it has a larger curved surface on top and a more flat, straight surface on the bottom. That effectively, engineers figured out in wind tunnel tests over a century ago, that that gives you some lift even if you don't tilt your wing very much into the wind. So that lift then is because the pressure on top is lower than the pressure on the bottom of the wing. And anytime you have high pressure and a low pressure, it basically pushes toward the low pressure, which again is lifting the wing. You need enough surface area on the wings to create enough lift. That is why early flying machines were biplanes. They had two wings stacked on top of each other on each side. Those early planes were mostly made of wooden fabric. Those materials weren't sturdy enough to support the single long wing on either side of the plane. Biplanes provided more surface area in a more stable fashion. But as materials changed and lightweight metals became available, monoplanes became possible. Monoplanes are basically what we see today. One wing on either side of the plane. No more stacked wing design. Better construction materials also allowed better and more powerful engines. Planes have evolved a lot from the slow experimental planes of the Wright brothers to the big commercial jets we fly on today. But what about the future of flight? Let's get back to the mystery sound for a clue. Okay. 
Okay, so now that you know that that mystery sound is a clue about the future of flight, do you have any new guesses? Um, maybe they're testing out a plane. It sounds like they're opening, like, a door while wind is rushing through it. Okay. Well, we're going to find out the answer right now. So the sound you just heard is a sound of a new kind of flying vehicle called a cyclocopter. It's a very unique flying device. It's very different. You know, it can hover in one place, just like a conventional helicopter, but it looks nothing like a helicopter. It looks more like a paddle wheel boat. You know, a paddle wheel boat where, you know, you have these paddles, which is kind of rowing the boat through water. Imagine that boat flying. So you have a number of blades, just like you have on the paddle wheel. And the key difference is it spins at much higher speeds than, than you would see on a boat, which would produce the required force to lift the entire aircraft up. So joining us now to talk about what the future of flight might have in store is producer Mark Sanchez. And before we go any further, who was that telling us about the cyclocopter? Hi, guys. That's Mobile Benedict. He's an associate professor at Texas A&M University, and he runs something called the Advanced Vertical Flight Laboratory. If I were into making acronyms, I would call it the AVFL. So vertical flight means that he's into planes that go up and down? He's a helicopter guy. So one cool thing about helicopters is that they're really good at hovering in one place. And they can take off and land vertically. So no runway is necessary. The cyclocopter Mobile was talking about can do the same thing. The one that he's been testing out is about as big as a house cat. So nobody's actually flying in cyclocopters yet, right? Not yet, no. But just like the Wright brothers, Mobile is hopeful. His vision for the future includes people flying around in personal air vehicles, or PAVs. Mobile thinks PAVs could be the next wave in transportation. You know, you could park it in your garage, take it out, you know, fly maybe 50, 100 miles your work or wherever you're going and, and come as convenient as a car. So it's small, it can carry, you know, two or three people. And once PAVs are cruising around with one or two people, Mobile thinks it won't be long until they can get bigger. So think of these PAVs like taxis or and then even bigger like shuttles or buses and possibly even a replacement for regional jets. Those are the planes that can carry around 50 people and generally fly about 500 miles. So what else does Mobile see in his crystal ball of aviation? I think he feels the need. The need for speed? Molly, I will always be the goose to your maverick. And yes, Mobile would like to see planes go faster. He wants to see supersonic planes. By supersonic, I mean which can fly at speeds greater than the speed of sound. That's called Mark 1, so more than Mark 1. So this has already been done. And from 1976 until 2003, people could fly all over the world on these Concorde supersonic jetliners. And in their prime, Concords flew to major cities all over the world at up to twice the speed of sound. So that would be Mach 2? Yep, Mach 2. So I could say something to you, Molly, sitting across from me. That plane would get there twice as fast as my words would travel to your ears. Whoa, that's crazy. But in order to go that fast, the Concorde needed a lot of fuel. And guess who paid for that fuel, you guys? Um, um, us. Yep, passengers. <laughs> An average ticket to fly across the Atlantic. So if you wanted to go, say, from New York to London or Paris... The average ticket would cost $12,000 per person. Wow. Whoa. That's a lot. But with the development of better fuel efficiency, Mobile thinks that supersonic travel is going to make a comeback and be much more affordable. But by the future's standards, supersonic is slow. We have been trying to go faster and faster. And, you know, probably the fastest aircraft that ever flew is an SR-71, which can fly three times the speed of sound. But we have been trying to fly much faster than that, even like 10 or 15 marks, which means 10 or 15 times the speed of sound. So these are called hypersonic aircraft. But so far, all the hypersonic air vehicles have been very experimental, you know, could not fly for more than a few seconds. Okay, forget supersonic. Mobile thinks hypersonic planes are in our future. Uh, Probably not for you and I to, f- to fly across the country, they're probably better suited for the military. So Aunt Gertie won't be scooting off to Las Vegas on a hypersonic flying machine. Not unless Aunt Gertie is in the military. Okay. <laughs> She's in the Air Force. <laughs> but who knows? There are a lot of engineers and technicians trying to figure out the future of flight. 
NASA is actually looking into a wing that morphs like a bird. So depending on the weather condition, the wing changes shape. And right now, as we're recording this, there is a solar-powered plane flying over the Atlantic Ocean. It's called the Solar Impulse 2. What does that look like? Well, it sort of reminds me of a dragonfly. It's got this long body, kind of really narrow. Towards the cockpit are these ginormous, oversized, outstretched wings, and they're covered in solar panels. It's a propeller plane, and it can only carry one person right now, the pilot. And right now, while it's crossing the Atlantic Ocean, that trip is going to take about four days, which means that pilot, since he's the only one there, he can't go to sleep. That poor person. I know, right? He can. <laughs> the best he can do is take a series of tiny naps. I imagine he'll be pretty tired when he comes back. Yeah, the future of flight sounds tiring. It does sound tiring right now, but it is still pretty exciting to think that we are here right now experiencing all these advances in flight. It's like being around the Wright brothers when they first left the ground. That is very cool. Thank you, Mark. You're welcome. It was a long process of trial and error. Designing and testing. For humans to be able to take flight. Everything that flies needs to balance four forces. Drag and thrust. Weight and lift. And even though air is invisible, it has mass. And can lift planes into the sky. That's it for this episode of Brains On. This episode was produced by Mark Sanchez, Sandin Totten, and Molly Bloom. Many thanks to Keisha Whitfield, Eric French, Dorothy Cochran, Eric Ringham, Amy Hyatt, Craig Hunnigs, and Stuart Bloom. Until our next episode, keep up with us on Instagram and Twitter. We're at Brains underscore on. And we're on Facebook, too. And if you like Brains On, consider leaving a review on iTunes to help other kids and parents find out about the show. Thanks for listening. listening.